Welcome to Codex. Our speaker today is John Jasper, who is an assistant professor at the Air Force Institute of Technology. Professor Jasper studies a wide range of topics centered around linear algebra, including functional analysis, frame theory, and algebraic combinatorics. I'm pleased to call him my academic sibling, co-author, and friend. To add to his list of scientific achievements, I'd like to add, only half jokingly, he may be the world's foremost expert in messing around with matrices. No, those are his words. <laughs> Today, he will tell us, no, the messing around with matrices part, those are his words. I'm the one who thinks he's the world's foremost expert. Uh, Today, he will tell us about equicyclinic subspaces. Please take it away, John. Thank you, Joey. Uh, thanks everyone for showing up today. Really happy to be here. Um, so uh, I just want to point out, uh, in case you weren't aware, uh, I'm trying to disseminate this, uh, that I'm, yeah, like Joey said, I've moved to Air Force Institute of Technology. I'm really happy to be here, get to work with uh, one of my mathematical mentors, Matt Fickus, uh, right, uh, even more regularly than I used to. So I'm really happy to be here. And I get to write this baller statement at the bottom of my talks that says, hey, hey, I don't speak for the government, okay? All right, so today I want to start with a real, uh, you know, a problem that I've worked on, but uh, a little bit more general than what I've normally worked on, which is, a subspace packing problem. So the question I want to look at is how do we arrange n different r-dimensional subspaces of either rd or cd, so fd, so that the smallest principal angle between any two is as large as possible. So in my brain this is subspaces that are as spread out in space as possible. So I've worked on this problem for a long time but in the uh, r equals one regime. In the r equals one regime we have a nice sort of at least an answer to that question. Uh, when, when R equals one, we, an answer to that question would be an equiangular type frame. Those are the spaces that are as spread out as possible. They only have one principal angle. So we only have to worry about one angle. So what is an equiangular type frame? It's just a bunch of vectors. I usually arrange them in a D by N matrix. So N vectors in D dimensional space. They're all unit norm. If they satisfy this condition, so the gram matrix here is a scalar multiple of a projection, then we call it a tight frame. And then, like I said, I want them to be equiangular. Uh, that is, the dot product between them is the same modulus for every uh, m not equal to m. So the dot product between any two distinct guys is the same modulus. If one and two hold, we call this collection an ETF, and I usually write ETF DN to emphasize which one it is in particular. I want to emphasize that the gram matrix is sort of of really high importance, and so I want to reformulate all of this in terms of the gram matrix and say, so here's the gram matrix. What are these conditions telling us? Well, the first one, it says it's got ones down the diagonal, because that's just the dot product of vectors with themselves, the norm squared. The second Tightness condition is telling us that's a that's a scalar multiple of a projection. Uh, another way to say that is that the rows of this matrix up here are orthogonal and equal norm. And the last one is telling us that the off diagonal have constant modulus. Okay, so all the dot products have the same modulus. So I've studied that for a long time, but more recently we've gotten interested in higher dimensional versions of this. So when we have lots of principal angles, what's the appropriate sort of generalization of this that answers the question, how do we maximize that minimum principal angle? And the answer to that is what we call an equisoclinic type fusion frame. So I added a few extra letters there. What's an equisoclinic type fusion frame? That is a bunch of little sub matrices here. So I write F to the D by R. So each of these is a D by R matrix and there's N of them total stacked next to each other. When we're talking about fusion frames, we, we're we really talking about subspaces or isometries at the same time. So uh, we're in my formulation, I'm really going to focus on the isometries, but you could think of each of these little submatrices as spanning a subspace, and those are the subspaces in the fusion frame, if you think of a fusion frame that way. But I want these guys to be orthonormal bases for subspaces with dimension R, because each of them has R columns. And just another way to say that is, well, then the, uh, the gram operator of each of these guys has to be the identity. 
So, that, so I have a bunch of subspaces or a bunch of isometries stacked next to each other. That's, that's just a fusion frame. Um, tightness is just like it was before. The rows of this matrix are orthogonal, or another way to say that is the gram matrix of the whole collection is a scalar multiple of a projection. But now, what is the replacement for equiangular when I have many principal angles? Well, it is, I need the cross gram matrices. So if I take the, not the gram matrix of each of these guys, but the gram matrix sort of one against the other. So phi M star phi M. I want that to be uh, proportional to a unitary. And I want it to be the case that for all of these guys, if I scale them by some universal constant, then I get unitaries for all of these m not equal to n. So, on, so if both of these two things hold, then I call it an equisiclinic tight fusion frame. And again, I want to focus on the gram matrix of this thing. It's a block matrix now, this matrix down here. And I can reformulate the conditions of an EITFF in terms of that gram matrix. It's got identities down the diagonal. That's saying that those little sub matrices are isometries. The whole matrix is, a, is uh, proportional to a projection. And then each of the off diagonals is proportional to a unitary. Not the same unitary, but they have the same proportionality constant. Okay. So I want to build these objects. I can either build this short fat thing up here, or I can build this gram matrix down here. And I'm going to do some of both. Right, because if I have the grand matrix, I can decompose into the phi as I need to. So let's see some examples of these guys. So I'm going to start with my favorite ETF, which is the ETF 3, 4. So that's four vectors in three dimensional space. That's my phi up here. And then I'm going to do some things to it to build well EITFX. Okay, well, the first thing is the totally trivial thing, and it's just to notice that an ETF is exactly the same thing as an EITFF, but with just one dimensional subspaces. So this guy itself is an EITFF 341. So in general, we have a collection of EITFF examples where we have one dimensional subspace, where that R parameter is one, and that's the ETFs that I've been studying for a lot of years. Two, we've got what we sometimes call the tensor trick. You can take and tensor an ETF with an identity matrix. It doesn't have to be an identity. It can actually be any unitary matrix you want. I'll use an identity for now. And you get something that looks like this. Notice that I've inflated the number of rows by two and the number of columns by two, but I didn't change the number of subspaces. And I put these little lines in there to indicate what the subspaces are. So this guy here is a unitary, this guy here, or excuse me, isometry, 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 isometry but they're for two dimensional subspaces and now the ambient space is six dimensional. So I went from an ETF three, four to an EITFF six, four, two, four two dimensional subspaces of R six in this case. In general, you can do this tensoring trick with any EITFF. If you start with an EITFF DNR, then you always get an EITFF MD and MR. Number of subspaces doesn't change, but the ambient space and the subspace both get inflated by the same amount. Now, this is important because it sort of tells you when you're hunting for EITFFs, what is a little bit more prized than others. These we call tensor sized because they sort of could come from a smaller guy. So in, if we find an EITFF where the first parameter, the the ambient dimension of the last parameter, the dimension of the subspaces is relatively prime, then we think, okay, this is sort of more of a primitive object. And it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little shiny uh, in, the, in, in this, uh, you know, treasure hunting that we're doing here. A third trick is a little bit, is a little bit more complicated, uh, requires a little bit more technology, but uh, it's worth mentioning. We call this the C to R trick. Um, we take an ETF and we build its gram matrix. Okay, now the gram matrix is going to have on its off diagonal well scaled roots of unity. So then what I do is I just do the usual uh, ring, uh, ring homomorphism from the complex numbers to the two by two matrices. Really, it's actually uh, an isomorphism onto its image. And I just do a straight up replacement in this matrix with 
this as my replacement rule. And my ETF, which uh, this here happens to be the ETF 69, so the, uh, the complement of Emily's favorite ETF. Um, I chose it because it has third roots of unity. So this is an especially nice replacement. I end up with that. And it turns out that that is the, the gram matrix of an EITFF 1292. Now you might say to yourself, hey, John, you said that's tensor size. We don't care so much about tensor size, but I went from complex to real and there is no real ETF 69. We know that that can't exist by Gerson's bound. So this one actually can't come from the tensor trick, right? So this one is actually sort of a, a, a more novel, we might say. Okay, so there's some examples to get our feet wet with what is an EITFF. So what I wanna talk about today is three constructions that my co-authors and I have come up with recently over the last two summers uh, to build EITFFs. We're gonna start, we're gonna do three parts and the three parts are kind of essentially disjoint. So I tried to indicate this even by coloring the slides differently. Um, I'm gonna tell you, uh, I'm gonna, so that each, each part is sort of disjoint so that you can sort of buy back in if you want to. When you see a big part come up, you can say like, okay, I was lost, but now I can come back in because he's gonna start essentially from scratch. So let's start with graph covers. What is a graph cover? Well. I'm going to start with, I need to talk about a, I need to talk about a, a slight modification of the gram matrix first, just because it'll be convenient for us to in, introduce this concept, which is, so the gram matrix was this phi star phi. I'm gonna do the usual thing. If you're familiar with the signature matrix of an ETF, I'm gonna do the usual thing, which is subtract off the ones down the diagonal and then normalize the off diagonal. So all I'm doing is I'm just making the, the, these diagonal blocks zeros and then the off diagonal blocks, I'm gonna normalize them so they're out not, now actually unitaries. What are the properties of this signature matrix that sort of define it as a signature matrix? Well, zeros down the diagonal, unitaries on the off diagonal, and it satisfies a quadratic. This is crucial because it's what tells us that it has two eigenvalues. So that when I add that identity back in, that I actually get a tight frame, a multiple of a projection. So uh, if I'm looking for EITFFs, I can actually look for these instead because of, I, I can just solve for the phi star phi in this equation, get my phi star phi back, get my grand matrix back. So now let's look at something that is almost a signature matrix of an EITFF. It's actually a graph cover. So there's the graph. It's actually a graph cover, but it's a graph in its own right as well. It's a little hard to see like that. So I put in some lines to point out that it's actually a block matrix. And then I'm gonna delete the zeros just to point out, just so it's a little easier to see. This is an example of what's called a draken, and I'll say what that is in a second. But for right now, I want you to notice how close we are to having a signature matrix. Because this thing has zero blocks down the diagonal. The off diagonals are not just unitaries, they're actually uh, permutation matrices. So very special unitaries. So it's satisfying most of the things it needs to. It's a graph. It's a, the adjacency matrix of a graph. So it, it, uh, it's symmetric. It's almost a signature matrix. The question is, does it satisfy a quadratic? And the answer is almost, not really. So if I square this thing, I, I do get a multiple of the identity, but then I get this sort of, this garbage out here. And so I need to fix this so that this stuff sort of disappears. So the question is, how do I do this? Well, in order to, in order to formalize this, I'm, I'm gonna have to tell you what a draken is. What is this object we, we were just looking at? It's an example of what's called a draken. That, and that stands for distance regular and typical cover of the complete graph, but we don't need that for, for our purposes. It's a block matrix. It's a zero one matrix. It's got this property that all the blocks down the diagonal are zeros. All the off diagonals are permutation matrices. So unitaries in particular. It's symmetric and it satisfies this sort of quadratic relation. It's not really quadratic. So once we have one of those, we feel like we're so close to having a, a, a signature matrix of an EITFF, we, we really ought to be able to find an EITFF. 
And we're going to use group theory to do that. We're going to use group theory to wash out this part of the EIT of the uh, of this quadratic relation. So in order to do that, we need the group gamma, which is what's called the permutation group of the graph of the Drakken. Since all the octagonals are just permutation matrices, this thing is generated by, or sorry, the, 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 they generate a group. They generate a permuta permutation group. We're going to call that group gamma. So let's look at our example again, and let's look at its gamma. So this example has only three permutation matrices on the off diagonal blocks. They are this one, this one, and this one. And if you look at how they operate on the standard basis, they correspond to these uh, transpositions, these two cycles. So we can see that gamma generated is generated by those three matrices. And those three matrices correspond to all the two cycles in S3. So gamma is uh, isomorphic to S3. So our gamma is S3. And I want to point out one more thing, which is this inclusion map. This inclusion map, which just takes the matrix on the off diagonal, that element of gamma back to itself, that's a representation of gamma. It's sort of a, it, it feels kind of trivial, but it's a representation. What if I replaced that representation of the off diagonal entry, sort of this inclusion representation with some other representation? Hey, I'd still have unitaries on the off diagonal. And my hope is that I can fix that quadratic relation so I get a signature matrix. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to apply a, a representation of my gamma everywhere. Down the diagonal, I'll just leave zeros. And my hope is that by doing this, I can get a I can get a uh, the signature matrix of an EITFF. Note that in this notation where I put a hat to apply that to the matrix, if I just do capital pi hat of A, I just get A back. But A doesn't have the quadratic relation I want, right? And the problem is that A has trivial, or excuse me, pi has trivial representation in it. So pi is actually decomposable. It's not, uh, it's not irreducible. You can reduce it down to this, pi, this little pi and a, one copy of the trivial representation where the little pi is defined by these on the two cycles. That's an irreducible representation. Since I threw away that one, that's what's gonna fix my quadratic relation. So if I apply that pi, that sub-representation of, of, of capital pi, the inclusion, I get this matrix, which, is a, which now satisfies a quadratic because I threw away that, that trivial representation. So S is indeed the signature matrix of, it turns out, a 5, 5, 2. Um, the 2 is obvious, the 5 is obvious, but this 5 here, you have to compute the eigenvalues, but it's from this relation, you can get it pretty easily. So it's five two-dimensional subspaces of, in this case, R5. So we have an EITFF, e R5, 5, 5, 2. How does this work in general? Well, in general, a lot of this theory was worked out uh, in 1992 by Godsell and Hensel. They, they said that they gave us most of the roadmap to what I've just been showing you. So you got a Draken, capital A. It has a permutation group, gamma. If pi is a degree, little r, constituent, just like in the previous example, of that inclusion map, but it does not have the trivial representation as a constituent of itself. So if we've thrown away all of the trivial representation that was in this map, then pi hat of A is always the signature matrix of some EITFF. Now, we need some drakens to apply this to. Hey, Mathon in 1975 gave us some really good drakens. They have a property that is pretty, pretty rare of, among drak drakens that we can find, which so for any prime power Q, he gave us drakens with these parameters with that permutation group gamma being the dihedral group, which is not abelian. So that means that the, the, we're gonna have irreducible representations that aren't one dimensional. So we can apply them and get proper EITFFs with the, where the subspaces are not one dimensional, just like in the previous example. So we came along and put all of this together and added a little bit of extra and figured out, hey, putting these things together 
And drawing a few more dots, we get EITFF Q plus one, Q plus one, two for any prime power Q greater than or equal to four by this technology. So a nice infinite family of EITFFs uh, consisting of planes, the same number of planes as the ambient dimension. For any prime power Q, we have Q plus one planes in Q plus one dimensions. So kind of a nice story. Now, we just used some representation theory. You guys are familiar with using representation theory to build ETFs, or a lot of people at, at Codex, I think, will be. And the story, the story often goes like this. I want to find a group and the unitary representation of that group together with a fiducial isometry so that when I hit that isometry with the whole group, when I use that pi action on that isometry, I build an EITFF. If this was an ETF, we'd be talking about harmonic ETFs. We'd be talking about things like different sets. And in fact, my first example is exactly that because ETFs are e EITFs, we might as well start there. So let's see if it, that we can fulfill this goal, at least in the case where uh, we're talking about one dimensional set of places. So take G to be Z7, that is zero through six mod seven. And now I'm gonna build a representation for you. And the representation that I'm gonna build, uh, it, this is where the secret sauce is, is in this representation. If you're familiar with harmonic ETFs, you'll realize this is the trivial character. This is sort of the first character. And this is the third character, zero, one, three. That's a really common example of what's called a different set. That's what's doing the magic here. Now here's my fiducial isometry, my first isometry. And now I just take this representation and I spin it up. Now tightness is gonna come basically for free. It kind of doesn't matter how I arrange characters down the diagonal of this thing, I'm gonna get a tight frame. But, the fact that it's equiangular is really coming from that special sauce that I mentioned before. So it turns out one can check that just by computing the gram matrix and looking at the off diagonal entries that this guy is an EITFF. It's an ETF, or so an EITFF with one dimensional subspaces. And I'll show you that at the end. But for now, I just want to show you, I just wanted to give you this to you as a single example that maybe we're slightly familiar with. Now let's see a more complicated example that, that sort of demonstrates where we're going with this, okay? So more generally, when we're talking about uh, harmonic fusion frames, we need to do a little bit more work to start. So we're gonna start with a group. In this case, I'm gonna start with Z5. And I am going to write down a tight fusion frame. This is not the, the one that I hope is, or that will be equi as a clinic. This is sort of this uh, smaller sort of combinatorial type object that's playing the role of the difference set in some sense. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry about it. We have this small type fusion frame. It's got subspaces or isometries that are indexed by, well, they're actually indexed by the dual group, but for now let's, not worry about that. They're indexed by this group, one, zero, one, two, three, four. And notice that the, the, I've written a, sort of a strange thing here because I really want my, my, my frame psi to be indexed by the dual group, the group. Um, and so I need to have a zeroth one here, but I want that subspace to be the zero subspace. So how do you write the isometry with range the zero subspace? Unfortunately, it's the two by zero matrix. Right. So this matrix here is actually a two by zero. It's really because I want to index things by that dual group. The other ones are all one dimension. Now here's how I build my uh, here's how I build my uh, representation. What I do is I take the character. So this remember was indexed by something in the dual group. So I take that zero and I put I put that character, that zero character, and then how many copies of it? Well, however many I need to get that number of columns. So none. I zero, that's the empty matrix. Okay, so maybe I'll just delete it for you so that you can see what's actually going on. In the second one here, right, 
The second column, I've got one column. So I'm gonna put an I1 and then I'm gonna have that second character or if you're counting from zero to the first character, second character, third character, fourth character, all with one copy. But these could be higher dimensional. These could be bigger isometries. So I might need bigger eyes here, okay? I wanna point out one more thing, which is, see that one over root two? Um, constants get a little bit hairy here. So I'm gonna start using this notation, just so you know that I don't really mean these things are equal. I mean, they're equal up to a constant because I don't wanna keep track of constants because it's not the important thing here. The important thing here is that this, this thing here, this tight fusion frame, I'm gonna take it and I'm going to adjoint it. So conjugate transpose it. Then I'm gonna hit it with this particular representation. But I built the representation just, have, just knowing what this guy was, right? So I built the representation only knowing Psi. So really all I need is to build this Phi sub G is Psi. Now, as I let G vary over the group, I build the whole frame, I build the whole tight fusion frame. Notice that since I started with a tight fusion frame, these rows are orthogonal. So these columns are orthogonal. So it's an isometry with a dot, right? Up to a constant. And so all the rest are isometries as well because I'm hitting them with a unitary representation. The only question is, why is this thing xy cyclinic? Because it is, but it's just not obvious at all. How can we tell that it's, that it's xy cyclinic? Okay, so let's go to full generality here so that I can tell you what's going on in general. And then I'm going to give you a, a short explanation of how you can determine if something's XYZ clinic. So we start with an abelian group. Whenever you have an abelian group, the character group is also sitting there. And I need that so that things work out real nicely in the end. So I have to introduce this at this point. Now, the other ingredient is a tight fusion frame. The tight fusion frame is indexed by the dual group, okay? Once I have that, it turns out that I have all the information I need. Just like with a different set from when we're talking about harmonic ETFs, I have, that gives me all the information I need to figure out is the associated harmonic ETF, harmonic type frame gonna be equiangular or not. This psi is all I need because it's indexed by this, this dual group and it tells me what the proper representation is. So my representation, all I'm gonna do is I'm going to take however many columns are in here. We're gonna call that D sub chi, right? So however many columns are in each one of these guys, call that D sub chi. You're gonna take that many copies of this one dimensional representation, this character, okay? So I just wrote it out for you here with identities. And then all I do is I hit the adjoint of Psi here, the conjugate transpose of Psi with this representation once for each element of the group. So I get a, a, a harmonic tight fusion frame. The tightness is pretty easy, but the question is, is it equize a clinic? And the answer is, yeah, it will be, but we need some extra stuff. What's the extra stuff? It's those cross frames. So in that, to check equisoclinicity, to check that two uh, uh, subspaces are equisoclinic, you take those isometries, you compute the cross gram, and you check that that's a multiple of a unitary. You have to do that for every single cross gram. So take any two out of my fusion frame, compute the cross gram, and I have to see that they're all the same multiple of possibly different uh, 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 unitaries. So I wanna compute the cross grams of this harmonic tight fusion frame that's generated by this little psi. So just for notation, psi sub g is just gonna be pi of g times that psi star with the appropriate scalar so that it's actually a type, so that it actually has uh, isometries First thing to notice is if we compute the cross grams just between any two guys, then actually you can rewrite that as a cross gram between the, the first element, the identity element in the group and this H inverse G. What that's telling me is that my gram matrix for this guy, no matter what, is always block circulant. So if my group is, uh, is cyclic, I'm gonna see these diagonals 
that are constant, that have the same exact block in them over and over again. What that also tells me is I'm trying to check that these off diagonal blocks are unitary or multiple, the same multiple of unitaries. I only really need to check either the first row or the first column because the rest of the blocks are just copies of those. So that's exactly what I do is I check the cross gram between the first block column and any other block column. And a little bit, if you just, uh, if you just write that down, you'll see that you get a sum like this. If you look at this thing here, you'll realize, wait, so I started with a tight fusion frame. If I take the, the isometry, one of the isometries out of that tight fusion frame and I multiply it by its adjoint, I just get the projection onto the range of that isometry. And then what I'm, so I've got for each, each element of the dual group, I've got a projection and I'm doing this sum over all the characters. I'm really doing like a entry-wise Fourier transform of these projection matrices. So to compute the cross grams, all I need to do is compute these entry-wise Fourier transforms of the projection matrices, which I'll label as M sub G. Those are the entry-wise Fourier transforms of the P sub chi's. So notice that they're calling the shots. All I need to know is that those M sub G's are the same multiple of possibly different unitaries for every G other than the identity. And so that's exactly the content of our theorem on harmonic ETFs. You have a, a group, finite abelian group. You have a tight fusion frame that is indexed by the dual group. Then you can build the harmonic frame generated by that guy. That's always a tight fusion frame, the way I've defined the harmonic frame. And it's an EITFF if and only if these guys are a common multiple of possibly different unitaries for all Gs other than the identity. So in order to check that this big frame phi is, an, is actually an EITFF, I actually just have to check a condition on the size. They're calling the shots. They told me how to build the big frame, and I don't even need to build the big frame to verify that it's an EITFF. I just have to check these matrices M sub G. So with that, I can prove to you, or at least I can give you some of the details of the proof that that example two was exactly what we were, was exactly an equiisoclinic type fusion frame. So remember, this is my starting equiisoclinic, or sorry, my starting type fusion frame. It's indexed now by, remember these are the characters. So then what I do is I build the projections. Remember this is the empty matrix, it's a two by zero matrix. So the, the associated projection is just the zero projection. And these are the other projections onto these subspaces, the, the span of these columns. And now I take the Fourier transform and I end up with this little two by two matrix that depends on K. But all I do is I now check M star M for every k other than zero, and I get three halves the identity every time. So it turns out by that theorem, this must be an equiisoclinic type fusion frame, and I built it for you so you can see that it's a. Uh, it consists of five two-dimensional subspaces of C four. So we have five planes in C four forming an equiangular type fusion frame. We can also go back to the first example, um, and. It's a little funny looking, but I want to follow the same roadmap, which is index it by the dual group. So zero through seven, or sorry, zero through six. So in this case, I, my small type fusion frame, my generating type fusion frame psi is going to be a one, a one, an empty matrix, a one, an empty matrix, an empty matrix, an empty matrix. By empty, I mean one by zero. That's really crucial. It's just one by zero. So the projections are one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. And if I compute that entry-wise Fourier transform, I just get this. Well, the fact that this has the same modulus, meaning it's the same multiple of a unitary, uh, for every k other than zero, well, that's the same thing as just saying the Fourier transform of this vector is spike plus flat in modulus. But that's just one of the ways that we characterize different sets. Zero, one, three. The, this is the indicator of zero, one, three. Saying that spike that it's Fourier transform of spike plus flat is the same thing as saying that this is a different set. So we've recovered the actual one-dimensional case. 
So this is actually a true generalization of the harmonic ETF story. So it's nice machinery, but did you do anything with it? Well, luckily we were able to do some, some kind of cool stuff here. Um, we made a little more hay with this than we did with the other, with, with the graph colors. So to set the notation here, um, you've got FQ cross, so that's the multiplicative group of uh, a field, a finite field of order Q. And we're just going to say that that's generated by the number alpha or the, the field element alpha. Okay, so it's a cyclic group of order Q minus one, so it's got a generator. So we've got two ways we can use this finite field to build us the little frame that is going to that is going to generate for us the big phi that is equi cyclinic. The first one, we need an odd prime power, so no powers of two, and we need chi to be an additively odd multiplicative character. So multiplicative character, character of the multiplicative group. Additively odd, just like you remember from pre-calculus, f of minus x equals minus f of x. Turns out we need that extra little property. It's satisfied basically half the time. It's not too hard to satisfy, but we need that character. Then we build this matrix. These dots might look familiar. In fact, what we've been building in our example two uh, that we looked at was this when Q equals five. So here's our little frame. We use that character to build out that second row. And we always end up with an EITFF Q minus one Q two. So Q two dimensional subspaces of uh, C Q minus one. And it looks like when Q is at least 19 and congruent to one mod four, we seem to have an infinite family of new equi cyclinic type fusion frames. Similarly, a little, little less restrictive, uh, when Q is greater or equal to four and uh, chi is any multiplicative character of FQ, then we build this small frame and it generates a harmonic type fusion frame that is an EITFF QQ2. And again, it seems, the, it seems like this is new about half of the time. So anytime your prime is congruent, your prime power is congruent to three mod four instead of one mod four. So we've built some, a few infinite families so far. Um, now we're gonna go a little bit crazy in two ways. The first way is that we've been dealing with symmetry in a lot of ways here. And we just imposed symmetry in order to build our frame. We said, let's build it by just spinning up one subspace. That sort of forces those subspaces to be symmetric because we built them with the action of a group. We're going to say, how far can we push that? And the answer is totally symmetric. Okay, that's not just a euphemism. They're as symmetric as possible. What do I mean by totally symmetric? Well, why are we looking at totally symmetric thing? What do we want symmetry? I want to. I, I, I want to try to convince you that this talk has been about symmetry. We used group representations a few times now in order to get to optimality, to get to equisiclinic type fusion frames. It seems to us that symmetry encourages optimality. We've seen this a lot in the history of studying uh, subspace patterns. So let's push it as far as we can. And with subspaces, we can push it all the way. So what is a symmetry of my subspaces? A symmetry of my subspaces is just an orthogonal map that permutes my subspaces. So I've got a bunch of subspaces in RD and the symmetry group or the group of symmetries is just the permutations of W that can be accomplished by orthogonal maps, okay? So, Right. If I just swap around some of my subspaces, it's not necessarily clear that there's a way to do that by an orthogonal transformation of space. But if there is, we call that a symmetry of the subspaces. And our goal is to find totally symmetric subspaces. That is where no matter how I permute my subspaces around, I can find an orthogonal map that actually does that permutation for us. Okay. Here's the plan. Here's how we're going to obtain totally symmetric subspaces. We're going to take a representation of the symmetric group, S sub n. Notice that at this point, it's become a little obvious that I've, I've switched something. I'm talking about the orthogonal group. 
Why is that? I was talking about real subspaces. We've seen a lot of complex subspaces. Well, it turns out that uh, when we're talking about representations of SN, they're really essentially all real. If one's complex, I could rotate space so that it's actually real. So I might as well just talk about real things. And I'll end up with real subspaces in the end anyway. So all the better. So we're going to take a representation, so uh, a, a homomorphism to the orthogonal group. And then we're going to let W be an invariant subspace of pi restricted to the permutations in SN that don't move that last element, don't move N, capital N. So we take that invariant subspace of that uh, restriction of the representation, and then we use the full representation to spin that around. Now it turns out that we're going to get totally symmetric and tight fusion frames out of this, pretty much for free. But equise a clinic, that's a little hard. That's going to be harder for us to accomplish. As is, as we've seen, that's always the case, right? Equise a clinic is the tough one to get. Can we accomplish this plan? How does this plan even work? Let's see a simple example, one that is going to be familiar to a lot of us. So if we take this representation, I've just defined it on uh, S3 here. So pi is a representation of S3. And I look at how does it, what is the stabilizer, what, what, what do we get when we restrict it to the stabilizer of N? Well, we just get this matrix and the identity. So what are the invariant subspaces of this matrix? Well, either the, the, the vertical or the horizontal axis, right? So let's pick one of them. I'll pick the horizontal axis and now hit it with the full representation. So in particular, hit it with this rotation. And we end up with a configuration of lines that I think we've seen before, right? Some of us probably call this the Mercedes Benz frame. And, it, and we know that this is an equi-cyclinic type fusion frame because it's an ETF, because it's simple. So let's go, so let's take, let's carry out this plan. I need a representation of SN. To talk about representations of SN, I have to talk about Young diagrams, but I'm not going to go into the details. What you need to know for today is that every representation of SN corresponds exactly to, is in one one correspondence for the Young diagram on uh, N symbol or on N boxes, N cells. What's a Young diagram? Well, uh, I think of it two ways. One way is, so this is a Young diagram, just ignore the gray for a minute. This is a Young diagram with eight boxes. It represents a partition of eight into four, three, one. So it's a decreasing partition of eight. Partition just meaning break it up into uh, uh, integer pieces. The way we write this diagram down is we throw down those boxes in this order. And the way I think of Young diagrams is you take those eight boxes and the Young diagrams on eight symbols are exactly what you get if you were to throw those boxes down and gravity works up and to the left. So all the boxes get crowded up into the left. So for every representation, there's a Young diagram and for every Young diagram, there's an irreducible representation. I should have said irreducible. So irreducible representations and Young diagrams are in one-on-one -on -one correspondence. And it's so nice that I can often just work in Young diagram space instead of working in representation space. And in fact, this stabilizer of that final point, it has a nice Young diagram representation. So if pi is the representation with this diagram, how do I get what? How do I get the representation that I would get when I restrict to S n minus one, the stabilizer of S n? What I do is I just say, what are all the boxes here that I could remove? What are all the nth boxes? The boxes I could remove, and there would I'd be left with a Young diagram. Well, it's these three. Right? It's the gray boxes. I end up with these three. And it turns out that that restriction is just isomorphic to the direct sum of the representations, uh, representations with those diagrams. So now, if I want an invariant subspace, I've got some. I've got three obvious choices: the space this one is acting on, the space this one is acting on, and the space this one is acting on are invariant subspaces of this restriction. So what that's telling me is that I want one of these and the big diagram because I need a representation and a invariant subspace W. 
So what I need is a diagram like this and one of the extreme cells. And what I'll end up with is some totally symmetric subspaces. Now, the question is, when are they equiacic clinic? And the answer is, that's complicated. I have to go a little deeper into the, into the math of the, the, the diagrams to figure out when they're equiacic clinic, but I can do some tricks with the hook length formula and, and, and Young's orthogonal form. I can do some work and I can figure out that it works infinitely often. So let me give you some examples. So these are the sort of the first order examples, the ones that follow the scheme that I was just showing you. So if my diagram looks like this and the red box represents that one extreme cell. So that red box tells me what is my, my W that I'm spinning around with the whole thing. If I have one of these guys, which is a rectangle plus the extreme red cell is just off to the right, then that diagram plus extreme cell is always leading me to an EITFF. That set of subspaces W is, is an EITFF. If I have, this little more, little bit more complicated example where I have a rectangle, like this one is a three by four rectangle where I removed a two by two square, and then I throw that extra cell up in that corner that I made. Then I will always end up with an EITF. So those two infinite families of diagrams plus extremal cells always give my, give me EITFs. Are they novel? Well, here's the first few of them with their parameters. So I have here n R dimensional subspaces of RD. So there's the 552. We've seen that one before. So that one's not novel. It turns out that for various reasons, several of these are not novel, but you don't have to go too far before you start seeing some novel, novel things. It appears to us that uh, if we have seven five dimensional subspaces of R14, this is the first construction of such an object. And a few more. So we have infinite families. Okay. Can we go further? Are there second order and third order examples? Well, what do I mean by second order example? Well, the first one was a was a irreducible representation I started with. Can I do this game with a reducible representation? And the answer is yes. You just have to you know cook things up carefully. So if I have a pie that is reducible, so let's just say it has two irreducible representation uh, sub representations, then I can do this so long as there's an extremal cell that I can remove from each of the two constituent representations to result in the same common diagram. So what that means is that this representation, when I do the restriction, well, the, the restriction here has a subspace that is R-dimensional that this sub-representation is acting on. So it has an R-dimensional row invariant subspace. And so does this guy, right? They both have R-dimensional uh, row invariant subspaces. So I can take rho and say, it's acting on these two subspaces, but it's doing it in essentially the exact same way, in a unitarily equivalent way. So if I pick my orthonormal bases for those subspaces correctly, then it's actually acting on them in the exact same way. You can just essentially ignore the one and the two. It's doing the exact same things to these orthonormal bases. Then I can stack them in such a way that rho is now acting on this R-dimensional subspace. So this is the R-dimensional subspace that I'm going to use to spin up. So now I just hit with the whole representation just like before, and I'm going to get a totally symmetric type fusion frame. When is it equisoclinic? Okay, well, that's more work. But infinitely often. Let me show you a few examples. So with one red box, that's the irreducible representation case, we have the first few examples we saw. We have those two inf nice infinite families. With two red boxes, here's a few examples that work out. Um, you can see the numbers get crazy big here because we're dealing with, with the symmetric groups. So we're getting factorial-like objects popping up everywhere. Hopefully formulas have these giant num numbers in them. So things get out of hand, things get crazy pretty fast, but at least we have one sort of reasonable-ish size. So we have 13, 700, 700, 7,700 dimensional subspaces of 42,900 dimensional space, real space. Uh, and then even more ridiculous, there's more of these. We were able to find an infinite family here with two red boxes, but we were really curious. Can you do the same trick with three sub-representations? So we worked really hard 
we, we got computers to help us do some algebraic geometry, some real algebraic geometry. And then we used the group law from theory of elliptic curves. And we were able to find an example where you have three, but it's huge. You have this many subspaces on the order of seven, 10, and 12. And then the dimension of those subspaces and the dimension of the ambient space, ridiculously huge, right? But we were able to find one. For four, no idea whatsoever. So nice examples, they blow up quickly, but they're not planes and they're for R, they're, they're for real spaces. But, and I think you know, a, a, a nice excursion into the symmetric group. I have three parts to this talk. I wanna tell you three directions for future research. First one is we saw these Draken things and we said we need a Draken with a non-abelian permutation group. Are there more of those out there that we can pull this trick on? We don't know, but it would be interesting to find out. Most of the Drakens we can find have abelian permutation groups. Most of the ones I can build do. Um, but it would be a it would be a nice thing to find. Might give us more EITFs. Are there more harmonic EITFs? We found one that is an 11.11.3. It's even real. It's harmonic. The proof that it it is actually an EITFF is complicated. It was a tour de force by Matt Vickis. Uh, if you want to read it, it's in the paper, Harmonic Cross Mayan Codes. It's in the appendix, I believe. Finally, N red boxes. Can we carry on that last picture? Can we get further down? Can we get more red boxes? Dustin and I had to use a lot of stuff we didn't understand in order to fool a computer into tell, spitting out the right numbers for us. If you know algebraic geometry uh, and you know elliptic curves better than we do, you might be able to just say, yeah, for obvious reasons, guys. And that'd be nice to know. We'd be really curious to find out. And with that, I thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker. There's a button. You're all good at Zoom by now. You know how to do it.